everybody, welcome to the show. Today, we are welcomed by Benjamin Percy, writer and author. <laughs> I say that because he's not only one of your favorite comic book writers out there right now, but also he is the author of an incredible series called the Comet Cycle series of books with a new book that just dropped recently, I want to say within the past couple of months, Sky Vault. Uh, before we get into the comics, and I know you really want to get into it, folks. I know I do, because uh, Predator vs. Wolverine is uh, one of my favorite series of the year. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Comet Cycles book series, and particularly how Sky Vault fits into it. Sure. Well, thanks first for having me on. My pleasure. Um, but yeah, I, I know there's a comics uh, podcast but and, and, and streamer. But it's, you know, I, I write books without pictures as well in the Comet Cycle. Uh, launched a few years ago. It's sort of my attempt to create my own Marvel or DC universe. And it's got an age-old sci-fi premise. A comet comes streaking through the solar system. Uh, debris, uh, you know, we spin into the, the orbit of all this debris that shakes up like the energy sector and the weapon sector and the laws of biology and geology and physics and creates in a very Marvel DC way, like a new dawn of heroes and villains. So the Sky Vault is the latest in this series. It came out in uh, September. Um, and it has to do with some multiverse stuff. It has to do uh, with uh, some strange voices that it can be heard over the radio signals, uh, strange weather patterns that are emerging over Fairbanks, Alaska. And the timeline is split so that part of it is set right now and the other part of it is set uh, during World War II. And it proposes that there was another lab beyond just Los Alamos, uh, another project behind just beyond just the Manhattan Project, known as the Alaska Project, uh, which was trying to do something else with the atom besides just crush it split it and created a detonation instead uh this lab was concerned with spinning the atom in such a way that one might be able to create uh a wormhole oh that's awesome all right cool because <laughs> i uh, i just love the premise of uh essentially some new metal being introduced into the world and creating a second gold rush yeah um, yeah so that's the energy sector i was like ninth, that's such a fun premise metal. The Ninth Metal, that's the first book in the series. And the thing about the series is just like sort of just like comics, I was imagining it like, okay, you can read Batman and you can read Wonder Woman and you can read Green Lantern. And you know, they're all part of the same universe mm -hmm. uh on parallel tracks. So these books are all telling like this larger, they're part of this larger narrative tapestry, and you can read them in any order. So yeah. even though the third book just came out, you can read that first or you can read the ninth metal first oh nice. uh, the ninth metal takes place in in minnesota and it has to do with yeah this this metal that is a little maybe there's a little bit of an equivalency to vibranium and then it can absorb energy mm -hmm. uh and and expel energy uh so it <laughs> you know it, it it creates this sort of deadwood 2.0 situation yeah where you know the saudis and the chinese and texas oil men and everybody else they're all rushing to you know northern minnesota the iron range of minnesota to <laughs> try to harvest this stuff and there's also government labs of course and there's also a cult that rises up and uh, i've been developing this with sony right now um as a pilot as well all sure. right sure. so we'll see what happens i feel like it really lends itself to a serialized television series so i'm excited to uh, to see how that develops but it's a it's a great premise uh folks if you haven't already checked it out comet cycle series sky vault most recent book in the series uh check out this book uh so i'm i uh became familiar with your work um i want to say it was because of nightwing but um i regularly read more of your work thanks to the krakoa era of x-men um, and your introduction to um, the the X Force and Wolverine series, and how they kind of like intersect and and, and deal with each other. Um, I wanted to know what uh, what do you love most about both of those books, like X Force and Wolverine, and how they kind of like relate to each other. I mean, obviously, you know, Wolverine is related to both of them in the Beast plot, but uh, but what what makes you sure. what what drew you to Wolverine slash X Force? Well, let me rewind a bit and just sure. talk about how things began um, mm. 
This was fall of 2018, I believe. Yeah. That's a that's a long time ago. I know, right? It feels like it well, it's, it doesn't sound too long ago, but then you do the calculations and it's like, yeah. oh no, that was a long time yeah. ago. <laughs> so I was about to walk into Halloween, you know, the mm. reboot, the David Gordon Green reboot. And yeah. My phone rang. There's Jonathan Hickman on the line. Uh, so I'm in the lobby, you know, like covering up one ear over the popcorn machine <laughs> and and trying to catch the southern draw. Uh, and he was taking over the X-Men. And he wanted me to potentially be a part of it. And he said specifically, you know, I think you'd kill it on X-Force. <laughs> and I ended up taking that advice literally. Um it, you know, he had the Bible written at that point. Sure. Uh, but he hadn't really gotten into the issues for Hawks Pox yet. Mm -hmm. And and he brought us all together at this summit. And and he basically said, this is the garden. Mm. What do you want to grow in it? <laughs> wow. Well, like so that, when he yeah. said, I, you know, you'll kill it on X-Force. I propose that X-Force be the murder book. That X-Force be the poison book. Mm. That X Force be the morally gray book, uh, because if you're nation building, and right here's this island of Krakoa that is going to become the mutant nation. There's mm. a lot of optimism in that, but there's also a lot of shadowy shit that goes on. Yeah, and and you know, I if if I pitch X Force as the Krakoan CIA, mm -hmm. um, I had on the one hand. You know, the director of intelligence in Beast, and I had the director of field ops in Wolverine, referring to them as the head and the fist of this unit. And yeah. and they're up to no good. You know, these are the, this is the, the shadow work. Exactly. This is, you know, the stuff that we only read about after several years later <laughs> when stuff gets declassified. Yeah, right. Or or when you know some informant uh blows on whistle. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's like it's uh it's unpalatable as it's happening, but in hindsight, you know, we've already benefited from the net gain of whatever shadowy stuff they were doing. So it's like Yeah. So yeah. I really wanted to to lean into that dirtiness. Yeah. And I always knew that that Wolverine and Beast were the main characters, despite mm -hmm. the fact that there's, it's a team book and I want to give everybody a moment in the spotlight. Sure. I want to, you know, mine all those emotions and give everybody their own arc. But these two, I knew by the end, were going to clash. Yeah. That all these threats without were going to lead to a battle within. Mm. And, and so you asked me before about writing X-Force and writing Wolverine. Yeah. Right. So Wolverine is my favorite character in comics. <laughs> and and uh, I first had the opportunity to write him as uh, for the podcast, you know. Uh, yes. So Marvel approached me about you know their 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 debut podcast series and all they knew was that it was going to be about Wolverine, they had okay. no. <laughs> they had no. They had no directive. It was just kind of like. Yeah, and Wolverine. and and so I was in a bake off. You know, it was probably like five other people in sure. line for this, and and I just went all out, like because this is the character. Besides Batman, like this Wolverine's my guy. Yeah, and and so I just put everything I had into this pitch. Um, it was probably you know like thirty single space pages. <laughs> and the subtext of it was like, give this to me or else. And, <laughs> and they gave it to me. So I was already writing Wolverine. Yeah. You know, when this Krakoa stuff started to pop up. Right. And there was not an, a Wolverine series initially. No, that's true. It, it had it been was, a while. And uh, it was never so a was... given that I would get that. Right, uh, right. But it took about, I feel like it was five or six months into the whole process. Yeah. When Jordan White called me up and he's like, you know, you've got Wolverine. Nice. And and I didn't have to pitch it or anything. Like it was wow, just, they just they were just like here. Because I you know, I'd written at that point like two seasons of the podcast series. Yeah. There's there was a proving I ground there. It's like been on you... X Force for several months, and it was just a natural, you know, adjacency that like I'm gonna write this story about Wolverine and the Krakow and era 
and I'm going to be writing X Force, and they're going to complement each other. Right. And and this is a team book over here. This is the Lone Wolf title over here. Mm -hmm. And you know, I my hope is that though one day there might be you know an omnibus edition that that just weaves them all together naturally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's the way I was writing it. Yeah. Kind of um, like uh like Ten Lives and Ten Deaths. Where it's like yeah. that is a book that uh you know there were two series you could read them irrespective of each other but they did complement each other and uh and they should be printed together i think they're separate books at this point i don't know i don't remember i have the them Death, no, they, they merged it they merged them okay yeah. yeah i i have it somewhere in the library and i was like did, did i have two hardcover because they always put out like nowadays you know if a book is going to be 12 issues and the sixth issue comes out, they're like, we'll put out a hardcover of the first six issues. And then, and then we'll put out another hardcover of the next six issues. And I'm like, oh, could you just, and they're like, don't worry, we'll put them all together after that. But, uh, but in the meantime, um, one of the, uh, the, the, the standouts from the, uh, the clash, as you pointed out with the, between uh, beast and Wolverine is the kind of like evolution or de-evolution of beast as a character uh, or as a morally gray character to a, I think, uh, not morally great we get what what side of morality beast is on unless you disagree and i'd love to hear your opinion on that where it's like how we took beast from where he was because it wasn't like uh beast was on the side of the angels by the time you got a hold of him well i mean if you look at beast he's got a sketchy history yeah you know, he's he's made some some decisions let's say mm -hmm. <laughs> And and so this isn't coming out of nowhere. No, uh, exactly. What I thought was like if you have this character who is incredibly uh, intelligent, mm -hmm. and who has carte blanche, you know that he has no oversight. That Xavier is basically like, I don't want to know. Yeah, Xavier is like this. This is part of successfully building a nation. Yeah, and I don't want to know about it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have somebody in that position of power, abuses will happen. Right. And so the thing I wanted to make certain of was that Beast had a code. Hmm. So just to sideline for a second, look at what's happening in Krakoa. I mean, right. here's Apocalypse. Here's yeah. Mystique. Here's Emma Frost. Yeah. Here's Magneto. Mr. Yeah. They're all true. part of the leadership of Krakoa, right? Like, yeah. So all of these mutants who once were really compelling villains are off the table as bad guys. Yeah. So I was like, well, there's an interesting opportunity to take, you know, this lovable furball <laughs> and maybe, you know, help people see him in a different sort of way. Yeah. Um, you know, in a Kissinger-esque way. Right. So, you know, I wanted to make sure this was a slow, gradual evolution mm -hmm. uh, to make it as believable as possible. Yeah. And you can see in the very first issue of X-Force, uh, the two characters who are interacting initially are Wolverine and Beast, and they're yeah. already ideologically opposed to one another. Right. When it comes to like what this island situation is about, and and anyways, you know that that, that cleavage grows greater and greater and greater until the end. And, yeah. And Beast Code though, all throughout, and he sticks to it is the greatest good for the greatest number of mutants. You know, it's yep. a utilitarian code, and and if he has to take out, you know, of uh, a governing figure in another nation if he has to create a blackmail situation if he has to uh spread disinformation if he has to dump some telefloronic technology <laughs> uh to mind control a nation if he has to <laughs> kill one of his fellow mutants he will but only because he wants what is best for krakoa right right so oh. uh we'll see like you know be, will there be some Beast Was Right t-shirts <laughs> Comic Con? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. That's funny. Uh, I'm excited now because, of the, like, as as of, as of the taping of this episode, we're seeing um, a, an introduction of a different Beast, and we're going to see that. I assume come to a head very, very quickly. 
I'm really excited about the possibilities of that. Um, apropos of your love of Wolverine, obviously the Wolverine series, uh, it one of the hallmarks of this of your Wolverine run has been uh, that it is reminiscent of what I expect from a Wolverine series, which is to say six metal knives blasting out of a man's uh, forearms uh, in, into the bodies of his of his aggressors, while also being totally different from what I have come to, to, to expect from a Wolverine series. Like this is a very different kind of book. Um, what were you inspired by to make this your Wolverine series and what distinguishments did you impose on yourself to like make it that much more different from what came before? Uh, a few responses to that. One, I was very interested in interiority, like the internal landscape of the character, exploring those geographies. You know, Wolverine's defined by pain. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes, we just get the external version of that. Right. Uh, you know, he can be very gruff. He can be, uh, you know, action-driven. <clears throat> but to me, there's something interesting to be said about Here's a guy whose scars, his wounds instantly heal. Yeah. But the scars in his heart don't, and the right. scars in his mind don't. So what's going on inside of that skull? Mm -hmm. What's going on beyond the armor of hair and muscle and adamantium inside of him? And so, you know, that exploration of somebody who isn't always able to articulate themselves verbally. Mm-hmm but they have a rich tortured inner life like that was sort of my my the way that i you know the lens through which i approach the series gotcha. um but also you know here's this opportunity with krakoa uh logan's never really had a home i mean he's had places where he lived yeah and the westchester mansion is probably the closest he ever came to a home but this is like this is them literally saying, here is your home. Right. You have a nation. You have a family. And that family for Logan is biological. Yeah. And chosen. Uh, and here's the opportunity for no other word for it, like happiness, which is a weird word for Logan. For Warren, yeah. Home. Big time. Um, but the thing is, and that's the sort of theory, the question that was posed in the first few issues. Uh, and he was just never able to drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Uh, it, unlike most of the other mutants, you know, this guy's been around for a long, long time. Yeah. And and he has that thousand-yard stare. <laughs> and yeah. so he's, he's suffered so much himself. He's seen other people suffer that he's... It's difficult for him to entertain any sort of optimism. Right. Um, and in fact, he starts to view Krakoa as a sunlit resort, like all-inclusive resort mm -hmm. that is making the mutants soft. Like he wants this for them. He thinks they deserve happiness. Yeah. But he also knows that the world's coming for them. Yeah, yeah. And that their guard is down which is one of the reasons that he goes along with X-Force for as long as he does, because that weaponized perimeter is necessary for them right. to survive. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. That's funny. Because um, he mentioned uh, optimism, and I, it occurred to me, I kind of feel like Logan, and this is just my, my own, like, myopic, myopic interpretation, but I was like, is Logan an optimist? Because I kind of felt like he very much puts on this exterior of being like, I'm, you know, I've been through it all. I expect the worst, but yet he persists. And yet sure. uh, he's always, he's always disappointed. <laughs> he's, he, he, he goes into the fray. He's never had a, had a home, like you said, but he always takes it. Yeah. You know, he's like, yeah, well, but I do have a room at the mansion like i do have a place like i have a i have a place in krakoa that i live like it's yeah it's i mean you can think of him as like he always gets up right so yeah that's exactly. a sign of optimism yeah yeah like i feel he like always it's not gets necessarily... up from, from when he's knocked down and he yeah. always despite the fact that he's a lone wolf 
right? He always finds himself in a team situation. Yeah, exactly. And he's always like disappointed that, that indicates by that he does have hope in his heart. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like it's it's not that he's like a, a happy go lucky kind of person. It's just that he's, you know, he expects he he like secretly harbors a desire or an expectation of a positive outcome right. despite everything he's seen. But I really like that thousand yard stare, like the the grizzled war veteran at peacetime. Yeah. Where he's sitting there at the at the at the lagoon or whatever, and he's just you know, this is, this this is gonna last. This is no, there's no yeah. way. <laughs> like these people think it's forever, and it's only been like a week. Uh, I kind of love that. I have to ask because this is uh, just so uh, so exciting for me. Um, how did the Predator Wolverine book come to be? So I've you know I grew up on Predator. I watched it when I was in third grade, I think second yeah. grade or third grade. Nice. Yeah, and I moved around a lot as a kid. One of the places I lived. It was supposed to Hawaii randomly. Cool. And and so, you know, I was living in this neighborhood that was right next to some jungle. So yeah. there was all these, you know, there was this just tangled jungle hillside next to me and a waterfall and a river going through it. And and when I watch Predator, there's always that guy in the neighborhood, you know, who doesn't have any restrictions on what they are able to see. Yep. So I was I always found that guy. Yeah. <laughs> In this case, his name was Travis. And, <laughs> and so that's where I watched Predator. And, and we would spend, you know, all the neighborhood kids, we would spend all this time playing Predator out, yeah. out in those woods. Um, you know, we had Nerf guns. And we would sure. smear our faces with, with mud from the river. Yeah. And, you know, we'd be leaping off the waterfall into the water. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> you know, pretending like <laughs> we were being pursued. And, yeah. Yeah, in my head, it was like a 50-foot waterfall. It was probably 10 feet. Um, I mean, probably, jumping off a waterfall is jumping off a waterfall. It doesn't but, matter how many feet there are. But right. anyways, awesome. like, <laughs> I saw that movie over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so it's def it's part of my creative DNA. And then I started collecting, you know, the Dark Horse comic series. Yeah. So anyways, when I heard that Marvel, that Disney had picked up 20th Century Fox, I immediately like as soon as i saw that headline <laughs> i emailed cb at marvel i was like you have to give me predator versus wolverine yeah oh you immediately wasn't even like i have to do a predator book or maybe we no. can kind of predator no. versus wolverine <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> because i you know i grew up wolverine's the series i probably collected the most as a kid sure um and as I said, he's always been my my favorite character in comics. So it was just like these two characters in my head had already fought. Right. <laughs> yeah. I've had four series of them doing this. Like, it, it's I, just let I, me tell you one. So I was able to channel like all my, you know, 80s macho dreams. Yeah. Into, into this idea. But CB said no, you know, when I first yeah. asked. And, and that's because they just like, we can't rush aliens and we can't rush Predator into a convergence with the 616. Like, right. We need to be really careful about that. It's, it's not that he didn't like the idea. It's just like, we we don't know how, like these are just going to be their own Separate. series for now. Yeah. There'll be an alien series. There'll be, you know, a predator. We're not going to do any sort of like intrusion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I just set uh, a reminder on my calendar for three months. <laughs> yeah. And then it went off and I was like, what about now? You right. Know, what about okay. now? It's every three months. I just what about now? What about now? That. What about yeah. now? And finally, uh, the opportunity came up. Like I was yeah. finally able to do it. And and I wanted to do it in a way that felt more than just a brawl. Like right. that that to me is the lowest common denominator way to do it. Sure. Um so it's like here's this guy who you could say is, you know, one of the world's greatest weapons or the world's greatest hunters. Uh, you bring the Yout jaw into that equation and that's a worthy opponent. Yeah. Uh, and then you complicate things further by revealing he has an adamantium skeleton. Then he becomes the ultimate trophy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I thought this is something that needs to happen over time. Mm hmm. So that, you know, one of the things about the Yautja, if you're familiar with, you know, the predator lore is that they adapt, right? Yes. They learn. Uh, they change their technology accordingly. 
mm -hmm. and their strategies accordingly. So I wanted them both to be young at first and for them to be progressing yeah. and educating themselves against one another. Right. Um, and that was an interesting situation for Wolverine in particular because he forgets because of mind plants, because of mind yeah. wipes, like he doesn't have the advantage of the memory. Yeah, the predator is going in one direction in terms of evolution, whereas Wolverine, it's very like you know, two steps forward, three steps back. Uh, eventually, he'll get to the point where he remembers everything, but even then, like, does he have the muscle? It, it's there's there's a lot there. Yeah, 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 yeah. but he has a so, yeah. So you know, I, I wanted to do these different chapters throughout Wolverine's history because he's been so many different people. You know, I wanted to do the Westchester version. I wanted to do the, you know, where in that case, like the stakes were, there are these kids. kids. And, yeah. Like I protect them. Or in another situation, it's like, I'm in love. Yeah. Uh, and I have to protect that person. Or, you know, these other situations, like I'm this raw, feral kid, yeah. essentially, who's 18 years old and doesn't yeah. really know his own powers yet. Right. Uh, right. And, and anyways, it was the breaking point is is the Westchester Mansion. Yeah. In that, the way I frame it, uh, at that point when the Outja attacks the mansion, Wolverine's finally like, "I need to end this." Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's what triggers the current storyline that runs throughout the the four issues. Yeah. Where he's like, the final hunt is yeah. here. I uh, I love there's a bit of there's a bit in there and it could be construed one way but it could also just be metaphorical where the uh, the predator helmet it becomes the template for the weapon yep. X helmet uh, was that your uh, was that your intent was like no they reverse engineered that technology yep. or was it? yeah, 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 okay. yeah. No, I, <laughs> yeah that was that was I mean I don't know if this is actually it doesn't have to be canon but it's canon, you know in your I wrote canon. it as though it was canon yeah and. And so I just love the idea of, right? Yeah, I think it's fun. alongside one another. That's something I wanted to do from the beginning. Totally. Yeah. I love it. So Cornelius um, studies the Predator helmet. becomes <laughs> the Weapon X helmet. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I just, I, I was, it was a series that I had been expecting since I heard the announcement. Like when I heard that uh, 20th Century Fox was acquired, I was like, well, I guess we'll get some uh, we'll get some dope crossovers out of it. Wolverine versus Predator, obviously, will be a big one. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, just don't, I don't understand how it didn't happen before. Like it just. I I know. Yeah. No. I mean, we got uh, yeah, we got three Batman ones. Well, four if you count the Alien one too. But uh, you know. But uh, yeah. Uh, before we wrap up, I guess I wanted to share uh, or ask about Sabretooth War because that's what we are currently ensconced in Sabretooth War. Yeah. Uh, how uh, now? A couple things about it. First of all. Um, we are, I guess, relegating all the Beast plot, because there was a lot of, like, Beast Wolverine stuff in Wolverine, but it's kind of being like, okay, well, we got two books, put that over in the in the, in the, in the X-Force book, and then follow it up with, uh, with Sabretooth War. Yeah. Um, is Saber, like, Sabretooth War, uh, the first issue, or the first chapter, seemed to be this, like, uh, what was it? the bloodiest marvel comic printed in you know decades uh yes. was that your pitch or is that just kind of like a because there's the blood hunt series that's coming out and they're doing kind of like a red band version of the book is this like an initiative that marvel's trying or is this kind of just uh you're know, like i don't know what they're doing over there i just wanted to make it as bloody as as, as all get out <laughs> i mean i always push the envelope i'm constantly being censored for sure. what i put into scripts um <laughs> And I'm able to get away with a lot of it in Ghost Rider for some yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. maybe the legal department forgets to read Ghost Rider. Um, but <laughs> oh, I mean, it's 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 a man who's a, a flaming skeleton on a rotor, on a motorcycle. I feel like there, there's a certain degree of expectations there. Um, yeah, and I meant I mean, to say, like by the way, the Ghost Rider series is was also an incredible book. Uh, oh, and did, I'm going as hard have... as I can with it. You know, I'm making it as heavy metal as possible. I, absolutely, those covers immediately in, invoke like a uh, like a. I mean. I don't really consider Meatloaf a, 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 a like a metal album, but I mean, Bad Out of Hell. <laughs> just the image of that is uh, yeah. it's just it's hardcore. It's dope. Yeah. Um, so, so with the Sabretooth War, uh, you know, you had the situation where in Hox Pox, Sabretooth is banished. Yeah. And that is the best possible thing that could have happened to Wolverine because mm -hmm. 
it's boring when people write series where they immediately have one hero fight their arch nemesis. Yeah. And, and that's some people's instinct, maybe because they never know how long they'll be on a series. They want their chance yeah. for the Titans to go head to head. I knew I had a runway, you know, during the crack Owen era. Yeah. I didn't know how long of a runway, but I knew I had one. You had some room. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted Sabretooth offstage and I wanted to build up that offstage mythology mm -hmm. because I wanted to end my run on Wolverine with this clash of the Titans. Yeah. And I knew it would only be meaningful if they hadn't, you know, had if they hadn't seen each chance. other for yeah yeah if they hadn't seen each other in a long time if they just had that weighted history if they just had like like i wanted to pump you know all that fuel and all that oxygen in so that when we finally lit it on fire it'd be cataclysmic Big. yeah uh so here's victor lavelle riding the saber tooth series mm -hmm. you know on the side yeah, that doesn't intersect with any of the other stuff going on in Krakoa Prime, let's say. Right. <laughs> so he's he's building up that offstage mythology. Yeah. And so it only seemed right that I know Vic. I've known Victor for a long time. You know, we're both novelists as well, and and horror heads. So we're yeah. we're we have a lot in common in our hard wiring. Um, and so I was like, let's let's do this, man. Let's let's you build up your story, I'll build up my story, and then let's, yeah. let's end it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, again, we're both horror heads. We both really wanted to make this as nasty as possible. Sabretooth is like one of the worst, and by that I mean the best villains in the 616. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, he doesn't have mercy. He doesn't no, he's sadistic. So You don't want the art to 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 do that you don't want the scripting to do that we just wanted to lean into it and marvel was like okay uh and cb said all right uh, let's call it the most violent story <laughs> in, Wol in wolverine's history you think you nice. can deliver on that and i was like yeah. yes sir <laughs> <laughs> like i happen to have read most of if not all of the wolverine series i i think i i know what has come before and i can deliver yeah that's awesome yeah. Um, so yeah, that is uh, well, Sabretooth War will be your kind of like uh, your swan song on the series, uh, or your run on the series. Um, yeah, I mean, if you there's another thing that's going to get announced soon, okay. but you know the whole the whole Crack Owen era is coming to a close, as everybody knows. And yeah, we're, uh, everybody's done. Like, exactly. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah no. Yeah. Um, and and they've got a whole fresh creative team, an editorial team taking over. Oh wow! Um, yeah. So so like we're I'm going out with guns blazing, you know, and and there is another thing that's going to be popping up, but my time on Wolverine will be coming to an end, and you know I've I've been extremely lucky to have written those two ten season ten, uh, ten season those <laughs> two seasons of Wolverine that were ten episodes each. Yeah. I wrote a graphic novel adaptation of Wolverine: The Long Night, the first season. Yep. Uh, I've written all these Wolverine issues and all these X-Force issues with Logan in them. Mm -hmm. I've also had these sideline, you know, events like 10 Lives and Deaths and yeah. uh, Weapons, you know, of, Weapons Vengeance. of Vengeance yeah. and, and another thing that's going to be popping up. So I don't know what the total is there, but I'm guessing it adds up to like 75, 80 issues of Wolverine. Not bad. And you add on 50 issues of X-Force and like... That's that's amazing. It's you know that's yeah. really that's really meaningful to me, especially in this current era of comics where it's so hard to to have a run like a like a, a really run. kind of like yeah like a long I, and healthy run. I'm extremely grateful to have been a custodian of you know my favorite comics character for this long, and appreciate everybody who's been along for the ride with me. Absolutely, man. Um, really quick, I have to ask about Weapons of Vengeance because it's yeah. it's so fun and uh, and it comes like you know barreling out of again out of nowhere like it it has the krakoa banner on it but like it, you could put it like you could do that i wanted it to be as evergreen as possible and it is like it feels very much evergreen um this was uh yeah this is you taking ghost rider one of your characters that you've been running with for at least 20 issues or more and uh and 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 slamming him headfirst into wolverine was that a lot of like how how uh how did that come about 
Well, I just knew. I mean, like, got these two hardcore characters. They're both, you know, Logan loves to ride. Yeah. Bike, his bike as well. And like, like got to put them together. Yeah. Um, so I did it a little bit already in Ghost Rider. Like I had a woven Wolverine cameo. Yes. Uh, but I was building towards this event. And uh, one of the things that I realized when trying to figure out how to bring them together. Well, two things I realized. One, we'd never seen their first meeting. Yeah. I mean, they have their first appearance together, but you never, they already know each other. Right, like, exactly. Where was that first encounter? So it was really cool to be able to be like, okay, how did that happen? Yeah. And yeah. however that happened, I wanted it to be relevant to the right now. I wanted some past situation, some horrible yeah. situation to not be resolved. Mm -hmm. So they would have to team up again in the present. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing that, occurred to me when I was thinking about, you know, the weapons program and everything else is that like hell has a pretty great arsenal. Yeah. So why wouldn't the weapons plus program have been trying to, you know, dig into that. Yeah. To yeah. like figure out how to contain hellfire right. to figure out how to, you know, I don't know, create a, uh, a kennel full of hellhounds or, or oh yeah no whatever, it's... whatever else so absolutely I, I propose this program you know project hellfire mm -hmm. um, and and so that naturally fits both characters and yeah you know you've got the spirit of vengeance over here you've got wolverine who has been uh used as an unwilling soldier by the government many times before yeah wolverine predator 2 any chances of that happening um let me say this there is more coming from there's more yautja coming down the pipeline for me awesome good okay <laughs> um and let's just say it's all interconnected nice oh, that's fun well ben thank you so much for being here man it's been an absolute pleasure love talking to you Rolf. uh thanks for giving your insights into this uh and of course folks don't forget to check out the comet cycle series they're books so They'll look good on your shelf. You'll feel smart reading them, and uh, and they are uh, still in, uh, in in theme and tone uh, like the comic books that we're talking about here today. Uh, looking forward to more from you, Ben. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And of course, want more Ben Percy. Ben Percy. Thanks, uh, Benjamin Percy. Thanks to everybody else for for listening and reading.